Cannonball Run 2. I've seen the first one before, and I didn't like it very much, <laughs> to say the least, uh, so I was curious on how the sequel would turn out. Well, let's first start off on how Jackie Chan and most of the Rat Pack is in here, uh, and alongside Burt Reynolds. It was really cool to see them all, but honestly, that's about it. Jackie wasn't shown very much. It was one of his first roles. Um, the Rat Pack was just there for the paycheck, honestly, and Bert was Bert, which I love Bert, but I like Bert when he's in other Bert movies. The whole movie was choppy and just not very good, kind of like Smoking the Bandit 3. Speaking of, I plan on releasing a video on reviewing all seven of the Smoking the Bandit movies. One thing that bothered me is that they had this whole plot about people owing money, and it, it really took up the whole movie. And then about 20 minutes before the movie ends, I guess you can call it the climax, but they just do a quickly edited together montage of the rest of the race. It would have been nice to see that the whole movie, considering that it is a cannonball run, you know, a race. I guess that's the first movie, but what I'm trying to say is that it was bad. One and a half out of five. Cape Fear. This movie was scary. Not jump scare scary, like in the gut. That feeling of, this ain't good. It was really good though, and seeing Robert De Niro in a non-mobster role was one, really refreshing, and two, he was phenomenal. Like, besides his goofy side of the character, he was just a creepy guy. And Nick Nolte, who plays the father, was... How do I put this? Did he touch you? Just watch this scene. Don't let that smile off your face. I'm asking you, did he touch you? His character shows someone falling into insanity and paranoia, and it's just amazing. Another thing is that this is directed by Martin Scorsese, one of my favorite directors of all time. But it does not feel like a Scorsese movie. It feels like a, an Evil Dead movie with all the weird zoom-ins and wacky angles. Uh, speaking of Evil Dead, you know that tree scene? Yeah, that one. I don't think I'll be the first to say it, but that whole scene is not scary. It's supposed to be a, sh a shock horror situation, but... You just kind of get uncomfortable, which makes sense, you know, that's kind of the point, but the difference between a cheesy scene from Evil Dead and Cape Fear, this whole scene makes you so incredibly anxious on what is going to happen, and not a lot of horror and thriller movies will do that to me. It was just really thrilling, that's the best way to put it. I'm on the fence if I want to give this a 4 or a 3.5 out of 5 because of the fact it was so wacky in some areas, but I think that's what makes it so memorable, and it adds to the insanity. So I'll go ahead and say 4 out of 5. <music> Captain Ron. I didn't write this review until like a day after I watched the movie, and that's because I couldn't come up with anything to say. Um, Captain Ron sounds like Beetlejuice. And I feel like Martin Short wasn't given his full potential, as we see him in other movies. And that's all I could get out of this movie. It wasn't bad, but just it was just really forgettable. And it wasn't really funny. Two out of five. The Cat from Outer Space. For having Outer Space in the title, it, I feel like there's not a whole lot of space-related stuff. Now, that's a very specific critique, I know. We see the UFO, and obviously the cat's an alien, and the cat wears a space collar to make him talk. You could easily replace the alien thing with just a talking cat, and then replace the government with just a circus, and then keep everything else, and it's going to be the same exact movie. What I'm getting at is, is if we compare it to E.T., the fact that it is very visibly an alien, you're thinking the whole time, ooh, we gotta get this guy home. A Jake, which is the cat, it's just a cat. And even with that, he stays on Earth anyways. So the whole movie really just, I don't know. Really weird complaint, but it was in my mind. Other than that, it's a little boring, uh, but that's just kind of on pacing. I enjoyed it, but I probably wouldn't rewatch it. Two and a half out of five. want to know about this right away, sir. We just got a positive ID on that red BMW. Mm. Hold on to your beans, sir. It's 
The Chase. What an awful movie. It, this is what happens if you let a middle school student direct a movie. It's got all the beats. Innocent man about to go to jail. You got the love interest. Uh, but then it gets weird. Cops getting interviewed while on duty, which it's interesting enough until you realize that the only reason that it's in the movie is to tell some sort of message on the risk that cops take in life, which there's nothing wrong with that. But they literally say that word for word in your face like you're a child. And that's for the whole movie, for every single character. Another example is the news. There's this big message on how the news sucks, basically. But it's so blatantly obvious on what they're going for that it just gets annoying. It feels like a parody, except that's not what they're going for. I think the coolest thing in the whole movie is probably the girl standing up and making her own choice. Stop embarrassing me. Do it or I'll blow his brains out all over live TV. Miss Frost, don't do it. You're confused. He's confused you. It's very confusing. Don't move! I said don't move! By pointing a gun at someone's head. A little goofy. The scene itself is pretty cool, and it feels the the least obvious thing that they're trying to tell in the whole movie. Everything else, though, a sixth grade creative writing paper. What are you looking at? Two and a half out of five. Charlotte's Web. I'm not going to say it's perfection, but it's such a solid story on life and death. You got the starts with birth, and then you got loss, then you worry about what life is about, but then you find a purpose, but then you lose something again, but then something will be born again. It's just a cycle. Besides all of Wilbur's crying, which kind of ruins the tender moments, it's a sweet movie with an asshole of a rat that I love, which is... Hamilton, pay attention. What kind of monkey shine is this? Three out of five. Up in Smoke. I'll be honest here, I think I know why this movie was made. Discussing it as a as a movie, you know, the plot gets thrown away, like, at the very end, so nothing really matters throughout the movie. Uh, and a lot of the humor is, you know, I, I found a lot of the jokes very funny, but a lot of the, the humor is pretty random. From a movie standpoint, it's decent, but I'm sure it's funnier if you're high. That being said, though, I think if you're going to watch a stoner comedy, watch Friday. I'll stand by it, but I think Friday is one of the funniest stoner comedies of all time. Three out of five. The Christmas Carol, starring George C. Scott. Yeah, I know. It's March. Well, I would have watched it in December, but listen, I didn't start in December, did I? So, here we are. Anyways, uh, I'll be honest here. You could show me any version of The Christmas Carol they are all the same to me. Even if it has top-notch CGI or great acting, not a fan. Was the George C. Scott one bad? Not at all. Acting was great. The story was very well shown, but it's just the same story, and it didn't really do anything new. So with that, three out of five. Christmas Carol 1954, also known as Scrooge. Uh, yes, I watched two Christmas Carols in the same day, one of the original Christmas carols, the one that, that set the standard, so to speak. That's all I have to say. The George C. Scott one is almost identical to this one, so my review is basically verbatim. I, I really don't know what else to say. Bah humbug. Three out of five. Clear and Present Danger. I actually reviewed the previous movies in the Jack Ryan trilogy in my 100 movie review, uh, Red October being the first in the series, I gave a 3 out of 5. And Patriot Games, surprisingly enough, I gave a 4. I don't remember anything about Patriot Games, so I don't know how much that holds up. But either way, the third movie, Clear and Present Danger, was very solid. Especially with Harrison Ford and the man himself, Willem Dafoe. I do wish they showed a little bit more of the ending trial, but... I guess the whole ending wasn't really about the downfall of the present. It was more about Jack Ryan staying an honest man, which I totally get. The computer tug of war was just a great scene, and the whole secrecy in the White House plot was just done great. Three and a half out of five. Cliffhanger. Literally the most diehard movie any movie can get. You have the off-the-job protagonist who is forced into surviving. 
uh, the girl brought along for the ride that needs saving, and of course, the foreign douchebag that just wants his money. I thought it was well worth the watch. It has fantastic squibs, cheesy acting with a decent action plot, and one thing worth pointing out, which this was probably done on purpose, the beginning of the movie shows how Stallone's character messed up saving this guy's girl. Well, he's pissed, and blames him for saying that he could have done better. This man. This man is responsible for the death of... No, no, no. The deaths, with an S, of at least three people just for trying to be a hero. Anyway. Three and a half out of five. Color purple. Whoa, whoa, whoa whoopee! Wait, that Whoopi Goldberg? This Whoopi? The one that sings with nuns? Yeah, and Danny Glover and frickin' Oprah. Yes, that Oprah. And you know what? They all do an outstanding job. It focuses on the unfair treatment of women, which, uh, I'll be honest, I won't dive into on that too much because I'm not the right person to talk about any of that. But all I will say is that I think it's done very well. And the character arc of Whoopi's character being able to stand up for herself was very nice to see. One problem that I have is I think the music choice is goofy at times. Like, we'll have a scene that, that'll make you cry. And then the next scene is Danny Glover's character goofing around the kitchen with cartoon music. Unless that's the intention, it just kind of felt off to me. Either way, three and a half out of five. Creature of the Black Lagoon. I haven't seen a, a lot of Universal Monster movies except for, like, Frankenstein. But this one was pretty good. Uh, the rubber suit was, well, very obviously made out of rubber. But it was modeled very, very well. And one thing, it was very to the point, which was odd. Th there was like barely any filler, and, and it was pretty short too, 79 minutes. One complaint is the ending. I feel like if they bumped up the runtime by like 15 minutes, I feel like they could have had a more relaxed out finale. Overall though, solid monster movie, but nothing crazy. Three and a half out of five. The Crow. I'm not sure if anybody will really get this, but the first hour of the movie felt like just one long movie trailer. Or a better way of putting it, I was just watching stuff. I felt like I was just watching footage slapped together. It's not like it was confusing or I didn't understand what was happening. It just didn't really feel like a movie. But then the last 30 minutes is probably the better part of the movie. It starts to feel like you're, you're watching a film. The idea is super cool, but for Brandon Lee's last movie, he was shot during the filming of this movie, uh, it's not worth re-watching. Two and a half out of five. Dante's Peak. Alright, listen. This is a disaster movie. Uh, there is no substance. It was solely made for those funny explosions, buildings and bridges being destroyed, and a feel-good ending. And this one is no different. Actually, yeah, this movie kind of blows. Acting can be a little cheesy. To make sure the audience still knows what's going on, they'll say stuff like this. Activity has turned the lake to acid. Acid eats metal. Damn, I loved every minute of this. Here's a good way of putting this. If you love War of the Worlds, Volcano, Core and especially Moonfall, you will love this movie. Three and a half out of five. Daredevil. As every 2000s Marvel movie, it has a fair amount of cheese. Yes, even Spider-Man has cheese, but I think this one gets a bit too much hate. I mean, it has a two out of five on Letterboxd. I think the main flaw out of the whole movie is it just, it's kind of like Spider-Man 3. It just crams way too much stuff into the movie. You have the main villain, who we don't really touch on until like an hour into the movie. Um, Bullseye, the secondary villain, who I personally love, but he could have been shrunken down to a side character. And then we have Elektra, who, well, let's be honest, her only purpose is to make a spinoff to make more money, which, which they did end up doing. But her superhero side is explained at the very end of the movie. Uh, two minutes of training, and then she dies like ten minutes later. She has no purpose, except for money and being a love interest. Uh, that being said, the action scenes are super fun. John Favreau and Ben Affleck have just a great chemistry. 
and Ben Affleck as Daredevil is just phenomenal. And even though I said the movie has cheese, it's really enjoyable. Three out of five. Well, that's the end of uh, March, which I gotta say, uh, March was a busy month, but I ended up watching all the movies that I wanted to watch. And, um, yeah, I think there was no... I think there was one or two kind of crummy movies that I would probably not bother re-watching, but I think at least... Uh, I think I watched 15 movies, so... I'd say 12 out of 15 movies, they were they were good. And even, I think, half of those 12 were really good. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I think March was a good month for movies. Next uh, next month is April. It's the Easter month. It, it's the bunny month. And I'm just looking over on the shelf to the left of me. And uh, I think we got a pr pretty decent lineup. I hope you enjoyed this video. And uh, I'll see you in the next one.